<laughs> How's it going? It's going. Questions? Look at which one? What about it? It looks hard. Okay. What did you try? Nothing. I don't know where to start. It's not more of a problem. I don't expect you to show the whole thing. Yeah, I, I know. It's like somewhere to start. Well, what is it asking you to do? It's asking us to find the probability of the two laws of the two years. Okay. So how can you get two losses in two years? Say that again. You get a loss the first year. Okay, one. You get one. Okay. Okay. That's a section. Okay. And then you get two losses the first year. Okay. That's a section. And, and then you'd have to and have none in the second, right? Yes. And okay. None in the second. And the last one would be none in the first and two in the second. Okay. Okay. Sounds like you have a place to start to me. So are we just at? So if you had probability of, just say you did one in the first and one in the second, how can you write that as a conditional probability statement? So we had, just to write it this way, we had probability of A and B, how can you rewrite that with conditional? Okay. Yeah, right. And then I can recognize them. Sure, I can. I can reverse the roles of A and B there, too, right? You could also write it as probability of A, probability of B given A. Either way works. Because your intersection is commutative, right? <coughs> How is the table set up for you? Okay, so down the first column is number of losses in year one, right? And then across the top is how many losses do you have in year two when you know how many losses there are in year one? That's the given part. So if you, how can I rewrite this statement that we just wrote using conditional that's actually helpful in a helpful form to use the table? Okay. Okay, so the probability of B given A in this case, the table is losses in second year given losses in first year, right? So we're writing it that way in this particular case would be one in the second year given one in the first year, right? So that would be point three in this again, yeah, reading it from that table. Then what has to go in front here if I write it that way? Yeah, one by one in the first year, is that what's given to you in the table as well? Well, it's given to you as a point three, yeah. It's given to you together, right? So you're going to look at probably one in the first year and then one in the second year given the first year. It's matching it up for you, right? To give you one in the first and one in the second. So you just have to read the number off the table. Um, well, it's not giving you this part. It's giving you the second part. The way the table set up is literally giving you this number. It's giving you one in the second given one in the first. That's how you're reading it off the table. But you, you know, and then you use the equation for the one in the first. That 45 to the x plus 1 is how you calculate the probabilities for the number of the first. So then you want to do it for, just like you told me how you broke it up into three cases. 
I'm going to do the exact same thing for the living game. I don't really want you to do it for the Jeez, why can't I talk over the top of myself? What will you do after you calculate the three cases? I don't know. Yeah, good. Yeah. 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 He, yeah, that was what he said originally. He said he needed to break it up into three cases. So we, I was just setting up the first one, helping set up the first one. Yep. But you're exactly right. We need to take the other two cases and now. That's exactly right. So what the, what the numbers in the table are giving you are those probabilities of the conditional. Other questions? Before I get doing more examples here? Okay. Well, let's talk about I was making sure I was recording. <laughs> Since I had the problems last time. I found out last time why the recording stopped. Apparently, this thing is saving the videos in two places on the hard drive. It filled my hard drive. I found the second. I finally found the second place where it was saving them, and I saved two hundred and seven gigabytes off my hard drive. So that's why it filled. All right. Uh, what was the last problem we did last time? Did we do four point eight last? Is that the last problem we did last time? Four point one five. Did four point one five? Yeah, we're switching packets. Okay. Did I do 4.6? No. No? Okay, let's do 4.6. So 4.6, you have some with high blood pressure, some have high cholesterol. It says, of the policyholders that have high blood pressure, 25% have high, blood, uh, high cholesterol, and you're wanting to calculate the probability of high blood pressure given high cholesterol. All right, so let's just write down the things we know. Let's say we'll have B is our high blood pressure. And C is high cholesterol. What things do we know? Okay. Ooh, hey, it's not a C. Okay. How did you know it was that way? I'm not saying you're wrong. How did you know it was that the conditional was written that way as opposed to the other way around? Okay, good. Yeah, so the, the, that first sentence, because it didn't say given in the sentence, right? It just said, of those with high blood pressure, 25% have blood, also have blood, high, Lord, high cholesterol. I am having all sorts of issues. So it's the high blood pressure part that was given. What is it that we want to find? Good, you want know, the P of B given C, right? In that case, it literally says, given the policy holder has high cholesterol. All right. So probably the first thing we should do is just rewrite our conditional probability with our formula, right? What is the formula for our conditional probability? Good. What was the probability of C, right? Now notice in this one, we already have probability of C, so we don't have to worry even about splitting it completely up. Right? We already have the probability of C. 
How are we going to rewrite our probability of B intersect C so that we can actually compute it? Good. Notice essentially what we're doing is we're trying to again try to reverse the problem, all right? This is the probability that we're, the conditional probability we're trying to compute. We're given this in terms of the reverse conditional, right? It's reverse. So all we're doing here is just rewriting our formula with the intersection and then reversing the conditional. Now in other problems that we've done, we had to split up the denominator into pieces, right? In this case, we only have to do that because we're given the bottom, right? So in this particular one, we would be doing probability of B is 0.2, probability of C given B is 0.25, and probability of C is 0.3. Which gives you what is it? One sixth. Questions on that one? See, we're going to do one more that's just a little bit more complicated, just to showing up the whole reversing the conditional and then having to split up your denominator using that conditional. So let's look at 4.12. We have patients that came to the emergency room. When they came to the emergency room, they were classified as either stable, serious, or critical. And then some of those patients died, some of them survived. So just to give letters to these, let's say the C is the critical patients. Let's say the S is the serious patients. And I'm going to give T to stable because I don't want to use S twice. And T was the next letter. I wasn't feeling very creative. And then, of course, we'll just use D for died. Well, I could have used a face with X's for the eyes if you really wanted me to. <laughs> Want to do that one? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> there you go. How's that for a symbol for died? <laughs> All right. So tell us some things that we're given. Okay, probability of C is 0.1. Okay. Okay. How did you know it was P of dead guy given C of 24? <laughs> Good. Good. It had to be critical patients before death, right? So they were classified as critical. Given they were classified as critical, you know that 40% of them died. So probability of death given critical is 0.4. So what else do we have then? All right, so there's all our given information. What is it that we want to compute? Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, we don't have a dead compliment here because it said they survived. <coughs> We all have those two possible categories. So either they dead, they're dead, or they survive. One of the two. All right. So same idea here. We're going to try to figure out this conditional probability. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's weird. Just given this direction. Anyway, if we use the formula, wait a minute. I think we might have these conditionals set up incorrect over here. So let's go back and think about the conditionals that are on the right. Make sure that we make sure that we agree that these are the way these conditions are set up. Otherwise, it's probably not very exciting. So we can think about this for just a second. So it said that forty percent of the critical patients died. Let's make sure we have this set up correctly before we go through it. So I'm trying to. Seems to me like it should be the other way around. Now let's just let's just go through and see what we got. So if we were going to do it this way, well, all right. Either they died and they survived, or they. Well, I'm sorry, it's right there again. Either they were survived and they were stable, or they, uh, given that they were stable, either they died or they didn't, right? Or was it serious? Sure, okay. So we can write this, I can convert this over to, this is why I don't think something's set up right, because I can convert this to this. Yes. I think it should, should that they died. They should be that, given that they died, they were critical to start with. I think these are reversed because otherwise, this is just reversed. This is just flipping this around, and you can put in point one. Yeah, this way would be much better, right? And that doesn't make much sense. So these conditionals need to be the other way around. We like that one. I know you like that one better, but these conditionals definitely need to be the other way around. All right, so it said that 40% of the, cri the critical patients died. We're talking about either, so that means that 60% would have had to have survived. So we have to split it up as into, no. How do I know that it's that way, that you're given they died to start with? If you were given they died, shouldn't all of those Shouldn't one add up to one? Oh, I've got that back. That's what the problem is. Yeah. Thank you. This is backward. The original conditionals were fine. I knew something was backward. Yes, given that they survived, right? What was the probability they were stable? That's much better. That's much more better. That's, that's much better. That's much more better. <laughs> that's the better of the bus. Yeah. Much, much more better. There we go. Okay, so we have the original conditionals set up right. It was, the, it was what we were actually trying to find was backwards. Given that they survived, what's the probability that they were stable? Okay, cool. Serious. 
serious, whatever. There's a big difference. <laughs> All right. You want the right answer or the wrong answer, Dr. Joe? I'm not sure I want an answer at this point. All right. Okay, well. How, how do we do that? How do we set this up using the formula? D of S intersection of Okay. All right. <laughs> It didn't look like the last one. I was very happy, very sad about me. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's go back to the top here. How can I rewrite this reversing the conditional? Yep. Yep. Good. So that's how we reverse the conditional, right? I want to make sure that if I reverse the conditional, I need the S kind of in the bottom, right? So I need an S on the top. Right? So they kind of cancel. Exactly. All right. So on bottom, I need probability of survival. Survival can be broken up into three groups, right? Either you were Stable and survived, serious and survived, or critical and survived, right? Okay. So just to write that down, you could be stable and survived, or you could be serious, and I write that time, and survived. And <laughs> I know it was at first. Or you can be critical and survived, right? We agree? There's three ways <coughs> given the three categories. Now notice that all of the conditionals that we were given, once we got it straightened out, all of the conditions that we were given are in terms of the classification of the patient when they came in, right? Critical, stable, serious. Right? So I want to write all of those in terms of that conditional, of those conditionals. So we would have, still on top, we would have the probability of S, probability of survived, given serious, given S. On bottom, I would want them written the same way, except that instead of S in the first one, I'll have a T. Yep, if I can get it to erase. There it goes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so since I butchered this problem to start with, let's make sure we go through it again. All right. This is the conditional we're trying to find. All of the, the information we were given was in terms of the reverse conditionals, right? So we're trying to reverse the problem in terms of those conditionals. So the first thing we did was just use the conditional probability formula, reverse the conditional on top, and then again on bottom I've got to break this into pieces, and those pieces better involve the conditionals that we were given. The reason why we had three pieces here is because you could, when you to be surviving, you could survive and be stable, you can survive and be serious, you can survive and be critical. So that was why we had three pieces there. So now we should be able to fill in all the rest of this. What's the probability that you were serious to start with? 0.3. And if you were serious to start with, what's the probability that you died? Or, so yeah, this probability you survived, I should say, it should be one minus the probability that you died, correct? So this should be point nine. 
if I'm reading it correctly. It said 10% of serious patients died, so 90% of serious patients survived. What's the denominator going to look like? Probability that you were stable? 26. The probability that you were survived given that you were stable? 0 0.99, because again, the probability that you died given that you were stable was 0 0.01. Probably serious again is 0.3. Survived given serious is 0.9. Last one probably of critical was 0.1. Probably that you survived given you were critical, 0.6. That is a number, last I checked. Yeah, it's not like it. Oh, yeah. oh, wait, it is. <laughs> it is big, yeah. Okay, what about is 0.3? That was 293, was that right? Yeah. 292. 292. Okay. All right. Shortcut now. There was no shortcut. That is how you do the problem. <laughs> That's it. All right. Does this idea of breaking it into pieces make sense? Assuming we have the problem set up right to start with? Yes. Okay. Sense. Cool. All right. Uh, yes. Never mind. Never mind? Okay. I'm good at that. Try to find, just right off the bat, try to find what the probability is. You can do it that way. If you want to figure the probability of death to start with, you can absolutely do it that way. Yeah. It's still, and doing it that way, basically you're, you're going to be computing the denominator perfectly. Right. Yeah. You can absolutely do it that way. The reason I do it this way is because most of the explanations that you'll see about this particular topic involve having a summation in the denominator. It's the only reason why I write it this way. But if you're more comfortable with figuring out what the denominator is first, then absolutely do it that way. Yeah. You can absolutely do it that way. All right, let's go on to new stuff. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. being roasted? Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure growing up I was well aware of how grossing it What would you call it back then? So Getting picked on? <laughs> oh, I was bullied. <laughs> Getting picked on? That's it. It's her. I survived. <laughs> Oh yeah, shoot! Now you're a professor. And now I'm a professor. Making yeah. bucks. Making bucks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're not complaining about the bucks, but it's not big bucks by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> All right, so probability distributions. This is where we're going to be going for actually quite a bit. We're going to build up a library of distributions. If you look at the front cover of your book, there's a bunch of them. You're going to memorize all of those things that are on your front cover of your book before the end of the semester. No. Yes. No. Yes, you no. will. The <laughs> inside front cover, I should say. No. No. Can I see it? Can you see it? I don't know. Do you think I can? Yeah, I read it every day. Yeah. I read it every day. Why art? Oh, hey, that's cool. <laughs> I'm not one of the. I'm, I'm actually on copy number two of mine, and then the same thing happened. My other one's at home, so I don't have to carry it back and forth, but the one at home is in two pieces. We have. We, I have to memorize 14 digits. Yeah, I ordered it online for $8, and it never came in. What? That's not good. All right. So in particular, what we're going to do is start with the fundamentals of probability distributions and then 
find my pen. Where'd it go? Thank you. <laughs> Chris made me sit it down. You made me sit it down, did it? That is all you. It was all you. That is <laughs> All right. So the first part of chapter two, it talks about just basics of what probability distributions are, what some fundamental properties are, and that's and how to do some expectation ideas. That's where we're going to stop for the test. So two one, two two, two three, all go together. In a sense, that's where we'll stop for the test. After the test, we will build up different types of probability distributions that pop up a lot in applications. So. All we mean by a probability distribution is just the, the list of possibilities of probabilities for a given scenario. We're just going to write it out a little bit more formally with a particular function that we write at what we call as a probability mass function. Now I'm going, I know I'm going to slip and call this a probability density function. The reason for this is, for right now, we are talking about dis what we refer to as discrete distributions. So what discrete means is that the, the possibilities are not connected necessarily to each other. So what I mean is, if I flip a coin, you get a heads or a tails. It can't be three quarters heads or one sixth tails, right? It's heads, tails, discrete possibilities. Okay. If you roll a die, you get one, two, three, four, five, six. I can't roll pot when I roll a die, right? Keep going, right time. This is a weird of marble. <laughs> Wherever it stops, that's it. Then I can roll pot. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so th that's the difference between probability mass function and probability probability density function. Exact same concept, except one is that your possibilities are discrete possibilities, the other ones are continuous possibilities. So the fact that you call one a probability mass function and the other one, and the other one a density function really doesn't matter. Okay? So the idea is the properties that they have. So the probability, a probability mass function is a function, I'll call it f, this, prob this probability, or this function, goes from the set of events of an experiment, that's your domain, to the uh, interval from 0 to 1. Um, actually, let me, um, no, that's not exactly how I wanted to write that sort of thing. Eh, I could write it that way, but I don't think I want to write it that way. Let's try it this way instead. Instead of writing it as a set of all events, I don't want to write it quite like that. Let's just say I write it from the sample space instead. Sorry. I know, I made you erase. That's why you shouldn't take you shouldn't take <laughs> uh, notes in ink with me because I'll make I'll write down something wrong. All right. So the idea here is that I want to assign I want to assign probabilities to particular elements in the sample space. The way your sample your sample space is a set of all possibilities for your outcome of an experiment, and I was thinking about doing this a little bit incorrectly when I was thinking about making the function. So the actual probability mass function takes a thing out of the sample space and assigns a probability to it. So to make sure that we have everything works properly with the properties of probability, we need to make sure that this function satisfies certain properties, so such that, well, if I'm going to assign a probability, what has to be true? Well, I need to make sure that I don't take an event out of the sample space and make, make it negative. Well, I've already handled that. 
with the range, right? But just to reiterate that particular property, I want to make sure that if I take something that's an actual honest to goodness possibility for a probability, I want to make sure that that is going to be strictly greater than zero for all x in the sample space. So I'm going to refer to S as my sample space, the capital S. Again, I want to think about these values coming out of the probability mass function as honest to goodness probability in this case. Later on, for continuous, it's not quite the right interpretation. And we'll talk about what I mean later when we get to continuous distributions. All right, so what's some other ideas that we want to do? Well, I want to make sure that my func if I take everything out of the sample space and exhaust all the possibilities, those probabilities should all add up to one, right? So in the discrete case, if I take the sum over all x's in the sample space of the probability mass function, I better get one. All this means is that, the symbol, all this means is that I'm taking every possibility out of the sample space, <coughs> plugging it into the probability mass function, and adding it all together. So essentially what this is doing is it's calculating the probability of the sample space, which we know has to be one. Right? Something we know with probability before. All right. So the last thing that we want to make sure it happens is if I have any event, so if A is a subset of S, so if A is any event, then the probability that A happens better be the sum over all x's in A of f of x. So the probability mass function just gives you a way of calculating probabilities from a function standpoint. All right. So let's do an example or two. So this is uh, 2.13. I won't do all the parts. 2.13 on page 59. The directions are find the value of C so that f of x is a probability, ma uh, probability mass function, or PMF. You'll hear the letters PMF and PDF come up over and over and over again. PMF is probability mass function, PDF is probability density function. All right, let's just do part, um, well, let's do part B to start with. We have f of x is equal to c times x, or x can take on any value, any discrete value from 1 to 10. All right, so if I plug in 1, 2, up to 10, am I going to have any negatives pop up? <coughs> no. So the big condition of being a probability mass function I want to satisfy is making sure if I add up all the possibilities, what does it have to equal? 1, right? So we want... In this particular example, we want, whoa, that was crazy. We want the sum from x equals 1 to 10 of c times x to equal 1. That's the big thing that we want, right? If I add this up over all possibilities for x, I need to get 1, right? Okay. So if I add this up for all the possibilities of x, well, this c is a constant. So what can I do with the constant with respect to the sum? Take it out, right? So we have c times the sum. Now, you could brute force this, but there is a formula for computing the sum of the first n integers. Anybody know what that is besides me? Close. 
n times n plus 1 over 2. Yep, so this will be 10 times 11 over 2. So the formula is, if you have the sum from i equals 1 to n of i, it's i times, or not i, n times n plus 1 over 2. I think that's yeah, we did it discrete, so yeah. I know you know it at some point in time. <laughs> yep, so your c will be, yeah, this is what, uh, 55, so it'd be 1 over 55. What a two. And the bottom, the denominator, the denominator here. Yeah, it's a two. Yep. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's do a let's do part uh, C, where f of x is equal to c times one fourth to the x, and your x goes from one to three and so on. <coughs> so it doesn't stop. So again, same principle. We want to make sure that when we add up all the possibilities, what do we get? One. So if I take the sum in this case, when x goes from one to infinity of this, we get one. Again, same principle. What can I do with this C with respect to the sum? And pull it out. And then hopefully you recognize that series is a special kind of series. It's geometric. The big thing for geometric series is if the series starts at zero and your ratio is R, if your series start if it starts at zero, then what does that equal? 1 over 1 minus r. What has to be true about r? Yeah, the absolute value has to be less than 1. Right? For those of you in Calc 3, a little bit of review for your test, yes? Yeah. yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's not so All right. Sweet, but, uh, I'm glad yeah, so this one, this one, we also did this in Calc. This one starts at 1 instead of 0, right? So I do a little bit of adjusting. This formula works when you put in zero here and get a one to start it out, right? To get one, to get this to start when I plug a zero in here, I can basically factor out a one fourth to have that happen. There's different ways that you can rewrite it and do it, but the easiest way I think to see this one is if I just pull out a one fourth, it makes my exponent x minus one, right? So when I plug in 1 here, now I get 0. So I really do get this. So that series now adds up to 1, minus, 1 over 1 minus a fourth. Right? Because notice when you plug in 1, where does your exponent start? That's 0, right? And here when I plug in n equals 0, it starts at 0. So I really can just apply the formula directly. Right. There's a couple of different ways to get at this, but I can't I can't use a formula directly on this one because it starts at one, not zero. Right? It starts at one. That's why I had to adjust it. <laughs> so this is four thirds, so you get so what, C times a third is equal to one. So C has to be three. Because you get three fourths on bottom, so you get four thirds, and your fourths will cancel. So you get a third. I will do arithmetic quickly, so because I trust that you can go back and do arithmetic. But sometimes when I do it quickly, I sometimes when I do it quickly, I do it incorrectly. So you might want to check it. Oh, I would not put me in that category. <laughs> I just said I make mistakes with the arithmetic. I've been doing math a long time. Yeah. yeah. How long? How long? Well, I did studied it for four years as an undergraduate, five years in grad school, and this is year number twenty-two as a faculty member. 
So a long time. You loved it before you went to school. That is true, I did. I was proving theorems in high school. There were geometry things that I would notice that weren't in the book, so I'd prove them. You annoy the crap out of my teacher. Please <laughs> go away, kid, you bother me. It's all right. Anyway, is this okay as far as being able to calculate those values of C? Yeah. Okay. Are we okay with this? Sure? Yeah? Okay. So just to get a couple more uh, definitions down, and then we'll do some more calculating next time. So we've been talking about this calculating probabilities on discrete sets. Even if they're infinite sets, it's probably on discrete sets. This is an idea that we refer to as, but we want to make things a little bit more formal as we're going on. So as far as the definition goes, we want to talk about what we mean by a discrete random variable. All right, so these little x's are the values that the, the, the variable can take on. It's a little bit odd because we refer to this as a random variable. What we really mean is that x is a function, capital X is a function. So this capital X really is referring to a function. Which equals some little value x. What we're doing is we are assigning a real number, little x, to each outcome, little s, in some sample space. So there is some, it's making things more formal, but it's really the same kind of things that we've been doing. It's just that if we're going to do a mathematical analysis of things, we need to have things that are associated with numbers rather than these more qualitative outcomes. So for example, if my experiment is flipping a coin, I want to try to analyze that mathematically. Well, I can say the probability of heads is zero and one half, the probability of tails is one half, but heads and tails don't have numeric values. So what this random variable does is say, okay, instead of calling it heads, I'm going to call it, say, zero. And instead of calling it tail, I'm going to call it, say, one. So then I can say the probability of zero, getting zero is a half, probability of getting one is a half. So that's all this random, you're going to see random variable a lot. That's all it means that we're doing, is that we're taking our sample space, that may or may not be numbers, okay? Our sample space may be qualities rather than quantities, okay? So our sample space may not be numbers. All the random variable is doing is saying, okay, if it's not a number, assign me the number. And then start analyzing the probabilities with respect to those numbers. That's all it means, okay? So that's what, that's what the difference between this capital X is gonna be and the little x is gonna be. The capital X, is the act of assigning values to elements in the sample space. The little x refers to one of those values. Okay. So the x is the act of doing it. The capital X is the act of doing it, making it a function. The little x is referring to actual specific values. Does that make sense? Okay. I just want to make sure that was a little bit more clear because we're going to see these words, let it be a random variable. The discrete just means it's discrete quantity like we talked about before, not continuous. All right. We'll talk about this more on Monday. Enjoy your weekend.